this Christmas. So, I only have three Sundays to talk to you guys about the birth of Jesus. Everybody gets all wound up and all excited about the cross. About how exciting Jesus died on the cross for us. And that's a wonderful thing. I'm not, like, putting that down in any way. But, I like to talk about the birth because, to me, he gave up so much in the birth, too. And the birth, he was sitting at the right hand of the Father. And he decided to enter the world the way that we all enter the world. From the Father to that is a big, big step down. He gave up a lot. And I'm not going to say any more, but you guys get the picture. He gave up a lot. He came down here as a baby who couldn't talk, couldn't tell anybody what he wanted. He couldn't do anything. And he didn't come to this big city, this big grandiose New York or anything like that. He came to Bethlehem and then lived in Nazareth. And I tell you guys every time I mention Bethlehem, or every time I mention Nazareth, Nazareth was like the, if Nazareth was a city in today's world, Jesus Christ, the guy who sat on the right-hand side of the Father, would have moved to Apache Junction. Like, that's literally what he did. Am I lying to him? No, I'm not. That is the truth. Not even Buckeye. He moved out to Apache Junction. Like, where there's trailers and nothing else. Like, a bad place. And he gave that up for us. So the cross, yeah, it hurt. And death was terrible for him. But he gave up in the birth, too. He gave up so much. Let us never forget that. So as a husband and a father, when I realize that Christmas is so close, there's only three Sundays away, I'm like, I have to go shopping. I haven't even bought my wife anything yet. Uh, what what is my wife bought the kids? Did my wife spend all my money? Am I going to be able to buy my wife anything? That's what I'm thinking as a husband. But as a pastor, as a pastor, I'm like, I only got three weeks to talk about this great thing. And I'm going to. So I stop my series. And we may go back to that series. But I stopped it. And this, now we're starting this new series for the next three weeks. And I'm calling it Christmas Behind the Story. So we all know the story well. We all know about Mary and Joseph and Jesus. And we all know about the donkeys and about the, about the farm animals that were in the barn. And Jesus was born in a manger. We all know the wise men and we all know the... These shepherds came. What we, what we, but what I wanted to do is, I think that pastors, when they find this story, they focus on those big characters, the stars of the show, if you will, on Mary and Joseph and Jesus. I want to talk a little bit about some of those ones that we don't talk about much, like the wise men. The wise men. One of the things I almost brought this series into the other one because one of the things is we build these nativity scenes, we build these nativity scenes. And we have the wise men and the shepherd all there with Jesus. Mm -hmm. The truth is, they weren't there with Jesus. Nope. Not for like two and a half years probably did they see Jesus. And we'll get to some scriptures that point that out later. But I'm going to pick some characters that we might say played minor parts in this Christmas play. In this Christmas story. And I'm going to ask ourselves, and we're going to ask ourselves, what can we learn from this person? What can we learn from the wise men? What can we learn from the shepherds? So in today's case, we're going to talk about the wise men. If we're talking about the wise men in the refuge church, we would bring up my dad and Ron and Bill, because those guys are all wiser than me. But these guys weren't wise, and these guys were beyond that even. They were very much wise people. They studied the stars, actually. Astronomers is what we might call them today. But they, they were very, very smart people. So, but I want to talk about how smart people don't always do what we think smart people do. <laughs> so we think that smart people, they're charismatic, and they know how to talk to people. And so they have all these friends, and they're very popular, and they're at the top of the list at the church. Everybody knows them. But number of point, my first point today is wise men don't always seek popularity. Proverbs 18.24 says, A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. James 4.4 4 says, You adulterers, you can take that part out. 
you adulterers? <laughs> Don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. The wise men understood this. They understood this. How do I know they understood this? Because nowhere in the Bible, nowhere are the wise men named or counted. Right. We don't know their names. We don't know where they came from. We don't know how many. We always think three because there's gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But um, how many know that uh, if I take six of us, two of us could bring gold. Two of us could bring frankincense. Two of us could bring myrrh. I don't know how many there were. The Bible doesn't tell us. It tells us there were three gifts, not wise men. So these guys, we don't know where they came from. The Bible never tells us. They only say the Far East. If I said Far East, I could be talking about North Carolina, or I could be talking about Tempe, right? Like we have no clue where these people came from. We only know they're from the Far East. There's only one clue to the, the only clue to the number of them is that there were three gifts. There were three gold frank. There were three gold frankincense and myrrh. So honestly. We don't know if there were three or a hundred. But that's my point. Is if they sought popularity, they would be named. We would know who they were. They, the story would tell a little bit more about them. But it doesn't. So later we, we will get into all of into all of today's scripture. But I wanted to start with just a portion of today's I'm gonna to be reading Matthew 2. 1 through 12, but I just wanted to read 7 right now. Uh, 2 7 says, Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. Even when they met the king, they did it in secret. I don't know about you, but I would be like popping that off Facebook. I met the king, looky here. Ah. Everybody would know it'd be on my Instagram, my Twitter, my Facebook, everything, right? These guys did it in secret. In secret. Part of that was Herod's fault, though. He didn't want people to know he was bringing them in. But even when they met the king, it, it was in secret. Most Christians are not very popular. In fact, most popular people who do things that are... Most popular people do things that are contrary to the Christian belief. The Christian lifestyle is not necessarily what these people live by. We're not to join evil, but expose it, and people don't like us pointing our fingers at them. People don't like it when we tell them they need to turn away from their sin. People don't like it when we tell them they're living wrong, right? So it takes away our popularity. We're not to live for the world. To try to impress others or do or do better than others. We are to help others impress themselves. So that makes it hard for us to be popular. Christians live for Christ, putting him first in everything we do. Everything we do. Living out his life in our lives. Chasing popularity can also be a form of idolatry because you're putting fame and what others think of you before God, right? Mm -hmm. So these people, these wise men, they didn't do that. We don't even know who they are. But we can, uh, seriously, popularity can be such a big idol. I remember there was a time in my life when that meant everything to me. I wanted everyone to hear me. And I ran around singing and dancing and I would say stuff to make people laugh. You remember? <laughs> I thought that was his wife. His wife is younger than me. His wife has been around me a lot longer. She remembers. But I there, you, there was a time when I was... Uh, that's, that, Billy, can you turn the fans on? There was a time when I sought popularity. And it sometimes... I put it before God, and we can do that. But, these, but my point today is the wise men didn't do that. So don't try to fit in with the crowd. It will only lead to compromising your faith. 
fit out instead. So fit out instead. 1 Corinthians 15.33 says, Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Bad companies ruin good morals. Right now we're dealing with my daughter who is 18 and she's in this rebellious stage. And she's like, I've tried everything and God's not helping me. And I thought, well, here's the thing. You're hanging out with darkness. So there's not, you're not going to be a very, you're not going to, to, you're going to turn into them. They're not going to turn into you. When there's 10 of them and one of you, like your morals are going to be broken. First Corinthians here tells us that. It's that do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Yeah. Tear, yeah, I told her, if you want to change, you have to change who you hang out with. But there's a point to that. <clears throat> because Tear is like, well, don't you think that I need to be a light to them? Don't you think Jesus hung out with sinners? <laughs> you're, you're right, Tear. You're right. <laughs> there, there's a middle ground somewhere that you've got to find. And at 18 years old, you don't know where it's at. Yet. So that's what I'm praying for you. <laughs> Sometimes we're growing and we don't realize exactly that our dad or our mother or that our grandparent know what they're talking about, right? Come on. Come on. <laughs> but that's where she's at. Matthew 10, 22 says, You will be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. So it's hard. I mean, it's hard when some of your friends are like, You've changed so much. Yeah, but it's good, isn't it? Doesn't Jesus look good on me? Like, doesn't Jesus look good on me? And they're like, oh, yeah, but it's not the kind of you I want to hang out with. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll pray for you. You'll be in church soon. <laughs> <laughs> so, popular, is popularity bad? No. No, in fact, I want this church to grow, right? I want to see the church, the church packed out. Amen. But, like most things, we have to approach it cautiously. Cautiously. Matthew 6.33 says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. So all these things. So seek God first, and then that popularity will come. Seek God first, then the church will be full. But we got to seek God first. We have to make God a priority. God has to be first. God has to be First, he wants to know he's first, and that may and that and that may mean you give up some friends along the way. Yeah. Now that we have covered that, now we're going to go back to our scripture that I told you guys. But I wanted to share that first. I don't know why; it doesn't fit in with the rest of my message exactly. But I want to share with you guys that it's not about popularity. Man, we have to put God first above everything, and even things that we don't realize can be idols turns into idols when we're not careful. So, so now we're going to go to our scripture. Matthew 2, 1 through 12. It, it says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east. Wise men from the east. There it is, from the east, but it doesn't mention a nation, right? So that's just, just to throw that in because that's what we talked about a little bit. Wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and had came to worship him. When, the, when Herod, the king, of, the king heard this, he was troubled and all of Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him in Bethlehem of Judea. So, for so it is written by the prophet. So, it doesn't seem like they're very wise here. Like, if they knew the scripture, they knew that people were not going to like Jesus. They knew all this. But yet, they went, where is this Jesus to everybody? And they called him the king of the Jews. They knew that Herod thought to be himself the king of the Jews. They could have put two and two together and realized that if they put this out there too much, that Herod was going to get a hold of it, and Herod was going to want to kill Jesus. 
doesn't seem like wise men to me. But that's okay. That's okay. So, but so he went and he got his own right wise men and he drove them together and he's like, You guys need to tell me about this prophet, about, about Jesus. And it says, And you, O Bethlehem, and the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who shall who will shepherd my people Israel. So now it's written. He says, now it is written. That is actually in Michael 5.2. It's word for word. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So like I said, it is literally Micah 5.2, word for word. So if they knew their scripture, they would have known that this was going to happen. But they spread the word anyway. Now this is written, Michael Fletcher, word for word. So we see here that Herod had his own smart people. He called all the chief priests and all the scribes of the people, and they gave him good advice, actually. They even quoted scripture. But watch what happens as we read number seven again. And we read this earlier. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from him from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. We didn't why didn't he ask the chief priest or the scribes? Why didn't he ask his smart people who he went to originally? Why did he go find these wise men? That's point number two. Wise men or true Christians stand out. So we may not be popular, but people want to be around us. People want to come to us when they're in need. People want, they, they come to us all of a sudden when things are a little bit rough, right? People will look at us and say there's something different about that guy. I'm intrigued by that guy. I want to hire that guy. When I have a question, I want to answer them going to that guy. Like, when I am at my weakest point, I'm going to go to that guy. I'm going to go to the Christian. I'm going to go to the wise man. I'm going to go to the one who knows God himself. That's who I'm going to. That's the thing. So we may not be popular, but people love us. <laughs> they love us. So I always tell my kids in, in high school, it's a weird thing. That they'd be like, Dad, were you a jock? Or were you like a stoner? Or were you a, <laughs> what were you in high school? Were you a skater? Like, what were you? Were you a nerd? And I was like, well, I had perfect hair. And all the girls wanted me. <laughs> <laughs> I went to a school where I was, some of you have heard this, some of you have 96% English second language. Like, it was not white people in my school. Like, like I, there were six white people and 11 black people in the whole school, I think. But I didn't call them black people. Nobody called them black people. They called them the basketball team. <laughs> I played basketball. So I hung around them. But I was white. So all the white people wanted to hang around me. They were weird. They like wore corn t-shirts, corn the band with backwards K. And they had green hair and mohawks and those were weird people. So they wanted to hang out with me because I was like the cool white pit kid who hung out with black people because I played basketball. <laughs> so the white people hung out with me, the black people hung out with me, the Mexicans hang out with me because, I don't know, people thought my dad was Mexican. And it was just like, <laughs> this is like just, I hung out with everybody. I was like that kid that, well, how did you do that, dad? How, how did you not like fit in at one group? Because people saw a light in me. Because people knew when they needed something, when they needed prayer, that Mike would be able to help. And even at a young age, I was a leader. And so yeah. it did, So one day I might eat lunch with these guys who were total nerds. I had this one kid, Nathan. He literally followed me around campus my whole sophomore year. I never, I didn't have a class with him. I don't know where I met him or anything. But he just <laughs> followed me. Like, but the thing is, is people wanted to be around me because... I was a light to them. Good. They will be a light to you. So I didn't fit in the crowd. I wasn't in the yearbook. You don't find me with this group all the time or this group all the time. But 
people, I wasn't with people, people were with me. Because they follow the light. They follow the light. So, anyway, I don't know what all that was for free, but. <laughs> <laughs> so, now I'm totally lost. I don't know where that came from, but. So, wise men or two Christians stand out. We stand out, and while we may not be the person they want to hang out with, they will, they, we will be the person they call on. When in need, just keep showing the love of Christ. And when, it, when it's time, they're going to need you sometime. And when, you, when they do, you'll have an opportunity to share Jesus. You'll have an opportunity to minister. So many times with Christians, and I used to get such big arguments with my father-in-law. Because so many times they're like, every time I see a friend, I need to sit by him. And be like, Jesus loves you, bro. And I don't know you, but Jesus loves you. Do you know that Jesus? I don't even know you. Like, can we talk about basketball? Can we talk about football? Can we talk about something else? Yeah. I'm telling you, just love them. Yeah. God will open up opportunities to minister. Yes. We don't have to slam it in their face. No. We don't have to push it. No. Jesus will give us an opportunity when we just show his love. They will come to us. Amen. They will want to know what is different about us sometime. We don't have to want to be their best friend. And we don't have to want to shove the Bible in their throat all the time. Like, we can love them differently. Jesus found their needs. He found that, oh, you have a blood disease. Let's take care of that. Oh, you guys need to eat. Here's these two fish and five grains. Now they're 5,000 fish. Like, Jesus took care of their needs. He helped them and loved them like that. He doesn't, you don't see him running around pushing stuff down their throat. He just took care of their needs. So wise men or true Christians stand out because they show the love of Christ. Amen. We stand out because we show Jesus. Not because we preach Jesus. And I'm not telling you never preach Jesus. There's an opportunity there too sometimes. But well, we've got to realize that it's not all the time. Mm -hmm. Sometimes God's just called us to show some love. Amen. But and let's read on. Read on. Oh, I'm sorry. In Matthew 5, Jesus tells us, it says, You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light up a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So we're going to go back to our scripture now. Matthew 2, verse 9. It says, After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when, when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother. And they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Again, doesn't tell us where they went to. <laughs> Just to their own country. Most of you notice, I highlighted, is it highlighted? I don't know. Then. Well, I highlighted some scriptures. This is because I want to talk about these portions of this scripture from 9 to 12. So, notice verse 9. It says they listened to their king. Mm -hmm. This is very much according to scripture. Mm -hmm. Titus 3, 1 says... Remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, and to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed. So many times uh, we don't like our president, and we'll talk bad about him, and we'll knock him down, and we're not going to do what he says, and oh, we want Trump, or whatever we say, you know? The scripture tells us that he's put in who he's put in, and we should listen to him. But... But if you keep reading, you'll read in verse 12. It says, And being warned in a dream 
not to return to her. They listened to their leaders until God told them differently. This is why it's so important that we know his voice. Because, yes, yeah, sometimes our flesh gets in and it tells us, I don't like that guy, and we don't want to listen to him. The wise men listened to him until God told him differently. So even if you don't agree with what I'm telling you, listen to your leaders until God tells you differently. And I, I don't like to get political, but that just popped out at me like so big I just had to tell you guys. So listen to your leaders until God tells you differently. Because sometimes God apparently speaks to us via angels. I've never been blessed by that. Like I've never seen that. But he has never spoke to me that way. In fact, he often speaks to me like he did Elijah with a still, small voice. So listening to our leaders is important. But again, God comes first. So here the wise men had a big old angel come tell them. It's important to us to know his voice because I've never seen an angel. Like I haven't been blessed like that. Like I, in fact, I think if I did, I would run away and be a little bit scared. <laughs> and I have scripture, scripture to back me up because almost every time you hear an angel, mm -hmm. angel come in the story in the Bible, what do you hear the angel say? Fear not. Yeah. <laughs> fear not. Because people get scared of angels, right? Like they're scary. I don't know why. Because we got these like pictures of these beautiful women with blonde hair and the gold wings and <laughs> all shining and, and Yeah, I don't know. I don't think they look like that. <laughs> I don't know, but I, I just I don't think they look like that. Because every time someone sees them, they have to say fear not. Like I'm so glad. I don't have to say fear not every time someone sees me. So point number three, wise men worship him in three ways. Wise men worship him in three ways. The wise men knew his voice because they spent time with him. We read the Bible story and we assume that the wise men were there with the shepherds at the barn and saw Jesus in the manger with the cows. But notice in verse 11, it says, and going to the house. Hmm. And going to the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. Not going to the barn? But we have these nativity scenes. <laughs> Throw them away. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Don't throw the wind away. Just throw the wise men away. No, no, don't do that either. Just keep it. Make sure you teach your kids right. But, um, so, it says they went to the house. Most scholars believe they traveled around two to two and a half years. That's a long time. That is a long time. I can't get in the car with my kids for, like, more than, like, two hours. So, that's a long time. The, the wise men likely traveled by camel. Camels make it about an average of 10 miles per day. For, and if most people assume that they were from the far, far east, which would have been like what we call Saudi Arabia now, that is 9,125 miles estimated away from where Jesus would have been. One way. At 10 miles a day. 9,125 miles would take about two to two and a half years. You think that they move a little faster on some days and a little slower on some days. But yeah, it could be a long time. These men were dedicated mm -hmm. to finding Jesus. They spent time finding Jesus. We seem to have trouble giving him two hours on a Sunday morning. We seem to have, I don't want to get up and get dressed this morning. Like, I don't have to. I have to iron my pants. Like it's all sun is the only day I iron my pants because every other day I wear jeans and it doesn't really matter, right? But like these guys spent two and a half years and we had trouble getting up and getting dressed and coming to church for an hour and a half to two hours. Your time is your worship though. Your time is your worship. God said a plan where we are to give one day a week. Just one day a week. 
He said it from the beginning when he created the world. He created it in six days, and on the seventh, he rested. Exodus 28 tells us, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. So we talk about the Sabbath like it's a day of rest. But Exodus 2 it says, To the Lord your God. It's not just rest. In fact, what do we always say? Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. It's a religious day. It's a day for Jesus. It's a day for God. So I think that the Sabbath seems to have fallen out of our graces in the church today. Like people are so busy, there's no way they're giving a whole day up. It's just not possible. But we need to. And I'm not going to push it like some of these other religions where it has to be this day and it has to be this time and you can't do this and you can't. Jesus shut a lot of that down and you will read in the New Testament. But I'm telling you, we have to give him some a day. We have to give him some more time. We can't live life so busy that we don't have a day for God. And they gave two and a half years. Most of us can't give two and a half. They worshipped him with time, and they worshipped him, number two, they worshipped him with praise. Matthew 2.10 says, When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. They fell down and worshipped a baby. And we know the whole story, and he died on a cross and he took a beating for us and he went down to hell and he beat death hell in the grave and right. he came back and now he's not in here <laughs> <laughs> and he came back we know the whole story we know that he died for us but we have a hard time raising our hands they fell to their knees right. yeah. they fell to their knees in worship. But I like what actually said before that when it said they rejoiced exceedingly. They rejoiced. Many of us have a hard time rejoicing on Sunday morning. But David said in Psalms 122, it says, I was glad when they said to me, let us come into the house of the Lord. He was glad. He must have had a good looking pastor like myself. <laughs> Just kidding. Wasn't it funny? I know. <laughs> he said, I was glad when they said unto me, let's come. He was happy when they came to church. Because you know, he was happy when they said, let's come to church. So they, they rejoiced exceedingly. And then they fell to their knees. I think we don't get excited because many times God doesn't show up. I feel like we can blame that on our quality of worship. So I just talked about how they fell to their knees, and but we had trouble raising our hands. So maybe they wanted, they, meaning David's people, and, the, and even the, the wise men who were excited to see him, maybe their worship was a little bit more than ours. Amen. Maybe God showed up for them because their worship was a little more intense. Mm -hmm. So he, they worshiped. Matthew 2, 11 says, they fell down and worshipped him. Worship is more than a song. It's a feeling of the heart. And yet today's church has made it the three songs, the three slow songs that we sing after the two fast songs. <laughs> we sing before the sermon. Those songs, is, that's what we've made worship. Yeah. Our worship isn't songs, it's heart. Is heart. It's not worship. Worship is what we do during those songs. The songs are not worship. It's what we do during those songs. Those words of those songs should come from your heart. Amen. You should allow them to speak to you and you should look for him in them. I challenge you when we worship next week, just take one verse of every song, lift your hands and talk to him. In your own words, don't sing the song. Just say something to Jesus. Say something to God from your heart. 
Lift your hands. Don't sing the words of the song because that's the words of the song. Just tell him you love him and why. Thank him for something when you're worshiping God. Tell him you're giving him something. Like my kids, my kid is being a pain in my butt and I've been stressing out, but it's yours now. Like my finances are crazy and they turned out something last night, but it's yours. Like give him something in your worship. Thank you. God's not like a children. Like if I give my kids kid something that I don't want, like my bad finances, my kids are like, I want that. But God's like, that's a gift. I'll take it. I'll take it. He, he's happy with it somehow. Because he's not like us, right? I'll take it from him. I'll take it. So worship has to be more than we are giving him. The wise men understood that. And then number three, they worshiped him. That was praise, their time, praise, and number three, they worshiped him with gifts. With gifts. A baby had been born. And they didn't bring diapers or bottles or baby wipes. <laughs> this was the first recorded baby shower. And they brought him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. I had five kids. I'm still I was still waiting on the fifth one for someone to bring gold to our baby shower. It never happened. It never happened. <laughs> gold is a precious metal. They brought gold for a reason. They brought frankincense for a reason. They brought myrrh for a reason. Gold is a precious metal that's been used for jewelry, ornaments, and idols throughout human history because of its color and shine. But in this time, it's interesting because gold was a gift you would give only to a king. And they gave it to the baby. Frankincense is an expensive fragrance or perfume from the trees in India and Arabia. India and Arabia, they were from the Far East. It's interesting that they brought the most expensive stuff from the area that they were more, most likely from. Myrrh is a specific kind of costly perfume made from a rare thorn bush in Arabia and Ethiopia that is used as an antiseptic, a moisting oil, and a balming fluid. They brought a balming fluid to the baby. It's funny because it's not funny, but it's interesting because as we read the story, we'll find that they have myrrh on the very end. Mary's coming to Jesus to anoint him with myrrh when she finds that he's not in the tomb. It says spices, but if you really study and you go back and you dig deep, you'll find that it was myrrh. The same gift they brought because they knew the story. Earlier, I joked about how if they really knew, they would. If they really knew the scripture, they wouldn't have spread the news. If they really figured out, here. they knew. They knew what they were doing. They knew what they were bringing, and they found him there, not lying in the manger, but in their house. The point is this: they didn't give him cheap gifts. They gave their very best to God. And so should we. Nothing else would have been appropriate. God wants our best. He doesn't want the time that we have left over. He doesn't want half-hearted worship. He wants our best. He deserves our best. I remember I had a pastor one time, and some lady, she was trying to be sweet. And she comes in, and she's like, I got a new vacuum, so I want to bring the church my old one. He said, take it back and give me your new one. And she said, what? <laughs> he said, we give God our best. She left the church. <laughs> she never came back. That's the point. We give God our best, right? Amen. If the church needs a vacuum and you guys want to give it, you should. It's fine. Bless your heart. I'm send you away. But the point is God wants our best. Romans 12, 1 says, I beseech you, therefore, Brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. 
Jesus tells us in Matthew 22, verse 37, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. All of heart, soul, and mind. In other words, our total being, everything within us, must be our worship. It must be our worship. So, there's a lot we can learn from the wise men. Just from the little bit that we read about them. We don't know their names or where they're from or how old they were. We know that they love Jesus. And we can learn so much from them. I think it, uh, that those lessons don't get taught enough around this time because we're so much wanting to talk about Jesus and Mary and Joseph. And those are interesting stories too. But I think sometimes, sometimes the gems that we really need to hear are hidden behind the little characters that we don't even know their names. So there's the wise man. And that's just my take. Um, you could probably read it and you'd find other things in yourself as you read it. I love that they did this too. I'm going to tell pastor that because he didn't say this. And I'll say, that's good for you. I'm glad you're reading the Bible. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you no, you were wrong. But um, yeah, God's so good. He can show us, he can show up in little things and the big things. He loves us through them all. Dad, Jason, and you come up. I'm going to take communion now. And I, if you're new here, I do it every week. I do it every week, and that's not a normal for a church. It's not normal for a church of our religion, especially. But I want to always let you guys know that Jesus loves you. So no matter if I taught on tithe, and I really didn't talk a lot about Jesus' death, or if I taught on something totally different, and Jesus just didn't really come up, we leave here knowing that Pastor talked about Jesus, that Pastor opened up an opportunity to talk about salvation. So that's why we do it every week. And some people say, oh, it becomes a ritual. It becomes a ritual when you allow it to become a ritual. Open your heart and you let it speak to you every week. And, and I think it kind of reminds us every week exactly of why we came to church. It's a good reminder to say, yeah, maybe pastor was really, really bad this week. Maybe worship was terrible. But I came for Jesus. I didn't come for the pastor. I didn't come for the worship. I didn't come to hear Billy's angelic voice. Remember I said people are ugly and fearful? Yeah, I didn't hear you come here to hear Billy's angelic voice. I came here to worship Jesus. So that's why we do this every week, guys. Just so you know. Just so you get it. Um, because God is good. And that's why we're here for Jesus. Not for anything else. We're here because, because he heals us. The scripture tells us by his stripes we are healed, right? So we're going to take the bread today. And has, there's a lot of sick people in our congregation. I don't even mention like you guys as family members, so I don't really know that you guys know. And we take the bread, just think of someone we know is sick, someone, someone that maybe fell down and hurt their knee this week, somebody, something. Uh, there's two people I know this week that fell and hurt their knee, so I just mentioned that. But uh, so you know somebody who's sick, maybe you're sick, maybe you're battling something yourself. What have we take the bread? Let's come heal the one of those people and over ourselves.
because he's forgiven us, because he bled for us. Let's remember that as a day. Thanks for coming. I appreciate every one of you. See you next week. Okay.